In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. O Lady Fatima, St. Joseph, all God's angels and saints, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Good evening. I mentioned that one of the sources for prayer which is most efficacious to get to learn to pray is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is divided into four essential parts. First part is on the Creed, the second part is on the Sacraments, third part would be on the basically the Ten Commandments, and then the fourth part is on prayer. Part in prayer is the shortest and the easiest to understand. So I'd like to uh, just take one of the numbers and develop my talk on that. And uh, the Catechism takes Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, you have the person of Jacob. Okay. The person of Jacob. So we've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one of one of the patriarchs in the Old Testament. So there's a passage where Jacob uh, is has a dream and then he finds himself struggling and wrestling with an angel. And he's wrestling with the angel the whole night. And at the very end, Jacob says, I want you to give me my, give you a special blessing. So the angel ends up by dislocating the sciatic nerve of Jacob. So from that time on, uh, Jacob would always walk with a limp. And the Jewish people would not eat the sciatic nerve of the animals that they, they'd be eating. But that, that struggle with, between the angel and Jacob, the catechism says that our, our prayer life is going to be, it's going to be like a wrestling match. It's going to be a real struggle if we really want to grow in our prayer life. <coughs> it's going to be a wrestling match. Okay, It's going to be a struggle. So we have to struggle and uh, we have to battle. We have to wrestle with uh, many enemies. When I was in seventh or eighth grade in, in um, junior high school back in New Jersey, <clears throat> I played a lot of sports, and one of the sports I, I did when I was in seventh, eighth grade was wrestling. Okay. And um, uh, I was pretty good at it, and I had an advantage over those that were my weight, about 110 pounds, because already I started to lift weights and do a lot of exercise and started to run. In fact, 50 years ago, people did not run. That's a more modern phenomenon. No? Uh, so I, those who are my, my size, I was stronger than them. So I'll never forget that the first, the first person I wrestled with, I pinned him in, in, in two seconds. I just took him, threw him down on the ground, and it took... Well, two seconds, no? As I grabbed and I just threw him to the ground and he basically, he rolled over dead, no? <laughs> yeah. 
Then the second one, it took about it took about 30 seconds. Uh, then the third one I pinned made me about a couple of minutes. And what what happened was is that parallel to me was winning another individual who was basically pinning them right and left like me. And that the guy that was winning was my best friend. <laughs> and we used to wrestle together and his older brother was one of the best wrestlers in high school. So we'd wrestle together, we'd lift weights together and we were, we were really good friends. His name was Jim Nolan, if you want to look him up. So guess who ended up in the finals? Me and Jim Nolan. I never forget. I was probably 13, maybe about 13 years old. So when we both arrived at the finals, we who were best friends became mortal enemies. So as soon as the the referee said, "Go for it," it was cutthroat. We went for each other's. I knocked him down, I got a couple of points, and he knocked me down. And then, I don't remember the details, but I remember I threw him down on the mat and I knocked out one of his teeth. Okay? Yeah. But he didn't stop, he still wanted to go after me. So he took, he took me and he threw me into the mat and I lost a pint of blood. It was the most brutal wrestling match in the history of that junior high school, no? And I finally won. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I didn't pin him. I won, remember, it was six to four. And that was the last time I wrestled. I decided to play baseball afterward. No? <laughs> but I tell that story because uh, building up to that, we were lifting weights, uh, maybe losing a couple of pounds. This was just junior high school, a wrestling match. No? I wonder how much how much we do to to fight to save our souls. Very little. But I remember when I, I was playing, I was playing, I was playing other sports in high school. Those who those who would wrestle, they, they would lose 5, 10, 15, 20 pounds to go from the 165 class to 135 class. And talk about, we, we, can't, we, we can't even fast uh, one day. I mean, these kids, they were gutting it out for, for three months, three, three weeks, eating nothing so they could go from 165 to 135 so that they could win. They could win the, win the wrestling match. In a certain sense, it's admirable to see what a teenager can do if he really wants to win at wrestling. What are we willing to do to grow in our prayer life? Not that much. Not that much at all. So uh, I'd like to go through uh, what, are, what are some of the major obstacles or enemies, or roadblocks uh, to to growing in our prayer life. So that'll be the topic today, to give you the major obstacles. Okay, the first one, I mentioned it two days ago, is we don't have strong intellectual conversions. We don't have strong intellectual convictions that prayer is important. I repeat, we don't have strong intellectual convictions that prayer is important. If we're convinced that something is important, then we're going to do it. That's why we were convinced, me and my best friend, that we really wanted to win that wrestling match. Come hell or high water, huh?
Think about something you really like. St. Augustine says that the human heart is created to love. But we have to choose wisely the object of our love and love love with all our heart. It's pure Augustine. I repeat, we're, the human heart is called to love. Choose wisely the object of your love, then love with all your heart. Our love should be for God. Our love should be for God. So one thing we're trying to do in, in, the, in this mini retreat is to form strong intellectual conversions that prayer is the most important thing in our life. And have prayer as the most important thing in our life, that should be our first priority. It should be our first priority. This year, 2024, to make a priority to put prayer as number one. Okay, the second, uh, the second obstacle and this is related to the lack of conviction is how often it e- how, how, how easy it is for us to procrastinate. Right? To procrastinate uh, to as they say, la filosofia de la mañana. I'll do it later. And I think number one and two are interconnected. We procrastinate because we're still not convinced intellectually that prayer is a matter of life and death. If you read my handout I gave the first day, I gave you a series of definitions on prayer. If you read it, is that what air is to the lungs, prayer is to the soul, right? If we don't breathe, we're going to die. If we don't pray, we're going to be dying spiritually. What's what air is to the lungs, <coughs> so prayer is to the soul. One of the greatest, uh, so yesterday I gave you a series of sources to help out prayer. Was that helpful? Okay. I gave you a series of sources. I only got through about five of them, and I, we gave you the handout where we gave you a huge number of sources that you can be reading. Related to this procrastination, there's uh, one of the greatest writers last century. His name was C.S. Lewis. And G.K. Chesterton, two of the greatest Christian writers. Chesterton was actually a Catholic. C.S. Lewis uh, never became a Catholic, but a very good Christian. And one of the best writers, he wrote, he wrote many writings, Mere Christianity, but he also wrote screw tape Letters. You know, screw tape letters is one of the best writings on the different ways that the devil, the different way that the devil tempts us. So you've got Wormwood, Wormwood, and you've got his nephew, and the devil is teaching the de- his his nephew the best way to tempt people. So I'll, I'll summarize one of those chapters to whet your appetite. So Satan calls together a group of the most prominent devils with the purpose of training them to bring as many souls to hell as possible. So one of the devils says to Satan, well, what we can do is we can convince the people, we can convince the people that heaven doesn't exist. Satan says, you're a dummy. People believe that there are, there are rewards for those people who do good in this life. They're going to think that there's some type of reward in heaven. 
And it is heaven. Another devil comes up and says, well, why don't we convince the people that hell doesn't exist? See, you're a dummy. There are jails. People know that if there's a chastisement, punishment for the wrongdoings in this life, there must be one for eternal life. So another devil comes up and says, I know. Why don't we convince the people to put their conversion and their prayer life off until manana, until tomorrow? And Satan says, yeah. Go out and tell the whole world, do it tomorrow. No hurry at all, just do it tomorrow. So, a lack of conviction, condition, uh, conviction can easily lead us into believing we can put it off until tomorrow. Okay, let's go down. Let, let's offer um, other another obstacle to growing in prayer, and this is take this is taken from the Catechism. And it's this, laziness. This is, this is the catechism itself. We are born lazy. <laughs> We're born lazy. There is a physical laziness. There is a mental laziness. There is a moral laziness. And there is a spiritual laziness. Let me ask you, what's harder? What's, what's, what, 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 what's, what's easier or more difficult? Okay, sitting down in front, sitting down on the sofa, okay, eating popcorn, drinking Coca-Cola, and watching a telenovela, or kneeling down on a cold marble floor in front of Blessed Sacrament when the heating is really not that good. No? That is far. <laughs> what? <laughs> that, is a, that is far. Too. Okay. All of us prefer to be plopping in front of the TV, sitting in the sofa, and, and popping in jujubes or M&Ms, okay? <laughs> or cookies, no? And guzzling down our Coca-Cola, no? See, we're born... We're, we're born lazy and we're born gluttonous too. So both gluttony and laziness, that's part of our spiritual DNA <laughs> as a result of original sin. It's interesting that Pope Francis, and he gives a talk, uh, the general audience, uh, this has been done since John Paul II, no, actually Paul VI, in which Wednesday they'll give a talk in front of the people. Do you know what uh, the Pope said? One of the biggest dangers, sin, big, most dangerous sins is today, he said on Wednesday. Spanish is called la gula. La gula. You know what that is? Gluttony. Yeah. That was his message this Wednesday. Interesting. No? Lagula. This is the Pope saying it. No. We want to pray. We want to pray that we have a hunger for God. Amen. It's much easier to just sit down and go to town, right? And the kneeling down. In praying, in fighting against temptations, going against aridity and desolation, prayer is uh, prayer can be very hard. When I arrived, uh, when I arrived in Argentina, uh, my superior, his name was Father Fontana, who died about ten years ago, a very good priest. And one of the, one of the first things he said, I was in Buenos Aires. He said this, Tiene que defender tu vida de oración. That was one of the first things he said to me. 
I didn't understand Spanish too well. Now I understand it. Defend, that means you have to fight to defend your prayer life. I was a priest for only about two months. He said, whatever you know, this is a very busy, very busy parish in, in San Roque there in Buenos Aires, a very busy parish. He said, whatever you do, hey, make sure you put your prayer life first. And I'll, I'll never forget the analogy he gave me. Sometimes prayer can be so difficult it's like pushing a wheelbarrow of cement up a steep hill. He said in Argentinian Spanish, but... <laughs> you hear that? It can sometimes be as difficult... Any of you push a wheelbarrow with cement? I mean, I used to do that as a kid when I was working with my dad at home. Is that easy? It's tough work because you got the wheelbarrow filled with cement. That's heavy. But you're not going downhill. You're pushing it up a steep incline. Uh, that's, what, that's what he told me. So prayer is going to be sometimes like pushing a wheelbarrow up a steep hill. It's heavy and it's hard pushing. So and I'm, I'm not saying this to discourage any of you. But I'm trying to be very realistic that sometimes prayer can be a real struggle. So if we don't have convictions and we're just capitulating to our laziness, then it's easy to throw the towel in. Now I've been giving these spiritual exercises for 18 years now. And... Um, and I know this, and it, 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 it pains me to say this, that most of those people have done the exercise. If they've done the 10-week program, they're thankful. But most do not persevere in their holy hour. Why? I would say still a lack of conviction, but also our laziness and our sensuality Gets the best of us. Give you, I mean, I've given you ten weeks. I give you all the meditations. I give you facilitators. I mean, I pray for you. I mean, I've I've served I've served you a, a a very spiritual, good spiritual banquet. Okay. And of and of all our prayers, prayers. Okay, the Rosary Mass. You know, sing your chaplet. Fine. But being faithful to a holy hour is the most difficult thing. But if you do it well, it pays off. Amen? Amen. Are any of you here faithful to your holy hour? None of you? Okay, well, God, well, maybe, well, maybe, oh, maybe, oh, maybe 35. Okay, good. Well, maybe have about 40% of you uh, that's not bad. Is it always easy? No? Okay. So we have about maybe half of you. Keep it up. The other half. Okay. Maybe you can make that proposal that you're going to give yourself that hour every day and to be faithful to it. Make sure you get a spiritual director. If you don't have a spiritual director, and have a spiritual director. That will be helpful because your spiritual director, you have accountability. Okay. Accountability in the sense they're going to ask, how's your holy hour going? I didn't do it. Why? Because I'm lazy. Does that come from the good spirit or the bad spirit? Okay. Well. <laughs> I'm not your spiritual director, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm a blunt New Yorker. I would just say, you're not doing it because you're lazy. No. Does laziness come from the good spirit or the bad spirit? It's the fallen human nature. And a lot of people... A lot of people are given the spirit. They'll, they'll drop out because they know their director is going to be asking, "Are you doing your holy hour? Are you doing your holy hour?" No. So make sure that you're going to fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. I, now I've given you, I've given you 20 tools. I've given you the Louisville slugger bat to hit the home run. Okay. So I've given you, I, I've, I'm giving you all the tools. Now it's up to all of us to implement these tools. You hear me? Yes, sir. 
Okay, so lack of conviction, laziness, sensuality. Okay, and next would be, um, yeah, lack of conviction, sensuality, laziness. And, um, okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about distractions, and then I'm going to talk about another one that is very, very important in our spiritual battle. I, I'm going to talk about the devil, because the devil does exist. The devil will try to convince us not to pray. Uh, but distractions. It's interesting that I mentioned Teresa of Avila as uh, the master of prayer. She does not give too much attention to distractions. This is the greatest teacher in prayer because she know she knows everyone gets everyone has distractions. And she calls it la loca de la casa. Okay. La loca de la casa. So all of us have distractions. Remember once hearing a, a story in the life of Saint Saint Bernard, the saint, not the dog. Okay. okay. <laughs> and he was on on a horse, sitting in his saddle, and he. Um, Next to him was was a friend that was was walking next to him, and um, the friend was a very good man, a very prayerful man. And Saint Bernard said, "You know, sometimes I have distractions." And his friend said, "Well, I never get distractions. I was a born mystic. A born mystic." So Saint Bernard said, "Okay, I'll tell you." You can say one our father without being distracted, I'll give you my horse. And the guy always wanted a horse. But he couldn't afford them because horses are pretty expensive. So he kneels down and he looks at Saint Bernard, he makes the sign of the cross, and he's sitting there in the saddle on this beautiful horse, and the man starts to pray as such. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be the name. Then he looked at St. Bernard and said, Will you give me also the saddle on the horse? (laughs) How easy it is for us uh, to be thinking about the saddle on the horse and the horse when we're saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, right? But one more word on, on distractions, and then I'd, I'd like to move in the, the way that the devil works also to pull us away from prayer. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that one of the reasons why we have distractions could be that the Holy Spirit is pointing out to us our disordered attachment. Okay? You hear me? Yes. Your disordered attachment. We're all different. And, and, and it could be it could be the gluttony. It could be Envy, it could be lust, it could be anger, it could be impatience, it could be materialism. So that that distraction could be, it could be the Holy Spirit himself bringing that to your attention because the Holy Spirit wants you, wants you to capitulate and try to overcome that disordered attachment. Until you overcome that disordered attachment, you're being blocked. You got that? So that could be the case, that you have these disordered attachments that the Holy Spirit draws to your attention so that you can overcome that. Okay? All right. Now let's, uh, 
let's, uh, let's address the topic of the devil. Okay, the devil definitely is going to do all he possibly can to prevent you from praying. He's going to do all he possibly can. Because the devil knows that if you take prayer seriously, he knows that you're going to make it. And if you really take prayer seriously, you most likely will be instrumental in bringing many souls to God. So you, you've noticed if you've done the exercises, you've probably never had so much temptations in your life after you, you did the exercise as well. Hello, right? So that's, that, that's, that's actually a good sign. You find that your spiritual life is a constant battleground now. That's actually a good sign. Yeah, it's actually a good sign. Don't think that, no, not, not, now you've done the exercise, concentrate, it's going to be smooth sailing, and it's not going to be that way. It's going to, you're going to have some smooth days, but there's going to be a lot of choppy waters, a lot of, a lot of tribulation. Okay, uh, an anecdote from the life of a saint. Saint Alphonsus Liguri, the founder of the Redemptorists. A lady approaches him and says, you know, every time I pray the rosary, I've got so many temptations when I'm praying the rosary. Saint Alphonsus said, that's a good sign the devil's angry at you. Okay, that's a good sign. The devil is angry at you. And you're going to try to pull the rosary out of your hands. So if you find yourself in spiritual combat, you're really fighting. The fighting is sometimes very intense. It's a good, it's a good possibility you're really on the right path. Hang in there. Hang in there. And temptations are not sins. Temptations are an opportunity to show your loyalty and your faithfulness to God. Temptations are not sins. It's an opportunity to show that we prefer God over that temptation. So, when I was writing out uh, this, uh, this lecture, I... I wrote down okay, wrote down a series of temptations that you've probably had in your life. Okay, you're you you propose to do your holy hour or to say your rosary, go to mass, whatever it might be. Okay, okay, the first would be okay, yes, I gotta pray. But I'll do it tomorrow. Ever happen? Oh, yeah. We already talked about that. Manana. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. Second would be okay. You know you're you're praying, but you're you're kind of wasting your time. You ever had that temptation? You know you're. You're wasting your time. You could be using your time more profitably. I think all of you have had that temptation. Next. All right. You're praying, but it's more important, it's more important to help others. You have, to, you have to be charitable. You have to help out others. Because if we really love God, then we have to love our neighbor. And you have this thought. This thought occurs right before you're about to start praying. You've got a neighbor there you have to help out. You have to make a phone call to help out this person. You maybe buy some snacks for the poor people you have in your car. All these different acts of charity 
surface in your mind. Because you know, this is much more important than you know, praying. You can put that off, no? But help out that poor person. Here's another one. Well, you remember you, you, you made that novena to St. Jude. You know, you prayed and you prayed fervently for nine days and St. Jude didn't help you. So basically your prayer, it doesn't work. You know, basically kind of wasting your time. You prayed, you, you know, you, you, you prayed so long and nothing happened. All these are temptations from the ever, from the devil. Okay, then you you go home, and your family, your family members, they say that you're basically a holy roller, okay? Un santito, okay? Right? And you are. You know, you're really, you're really a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, yeah. So they're right at home. You're a holy roller, un santito. You're a hypocrite. You're doing all those prayers. And look at your life. Hey, you're wasting your time. You're not getting better. You're caught a hudo. You're, you're angry. You're impatient. In a prayer, you know, it's not helping you well. So the the devil can actually utilize your family members to attack you. Okay, and he's going to do all he possibly can so that you throw in the towel and give up. Good sign. Good sign. Okay, I, I, wrote up, I, I wrote down about ten different temptations. I've gotten through about four or five. Here's another one. Well, you want to pray early in the morning. You know, you're just, you're just too tired in the morning. You're so tired, better to get your beauty rest, okay? Right? You know, to get your beauty rest, you know, people don't want to look at you and think there's una bruja, you know, you know, a witch, you know. You really get up early, they're going to look at you, wow, you really look bad. You know? <laughs> Too tired, you know, you get your beauty rest, get your beauty rest, and then you can pray tomorrow. Okay, now, th this is a pretty common one. You're praying, you're praying for a relative and you're making novena. You're praying fervently and uh, your, your relative that you prayed for was in the hospital instead of he dies. Father, your mother. There, you know, there are people that will actually turn against God because some relative or friend dies, passes away, and then they they blame God, saying, you know, I, I prayed, I went to Mass, I offered, I offered rosaries, and look what happened here. So they actually, they blame God for the death, death of that person. You'd be surprised how many people have turned off to God because of that. Do any of you know any relatives, maybe, are in that category? I think most of you. So the devil is so astute. He'll do all he possibly can to pull us away from prayer. All he possibly can. Then another one is this. Well, why should I, why should I pray to God? He knows 
what I need anyway. And God is all knowing, right? He's um, omniscient. He knows what I need. Well, I even ask him if he already knows anyway. This one I, this one I heard in um, in Italy. I asked a man, "Do you go to church on Sunday?" And he says, "No." Do you pray? No. And he said, "I said why?" He said, "Because my wife prays for me." <laughs> Very Italian, huh? Have you ever read the uh, the Desert Monks? There's a lot of beautiful stories of the Desert Monks. Uh, one is one story is you have the uh, Father Abbot who's sitting there in the choir when the monks are doing their holy hour. He's able to see all the different devils that are there in the choir. So, Father Monk is saying there's one devil that during the holy hour is thinking about what's for breakfast. That's before his eyes. No? Another one is thinking about his, his, his ex-girlfriend. Okay. Then there's a, there's a choir chair where... The monk is not there because the devil convinced him not to get out of bed. <laughs> so the father abbot was able to see all these different types of devils that were tempting the monks so that they wouldn't pray or they'd pray, they'd pray poorly. So I wonder, of all the devils, which is the devil that seems to tempt you most to prevent you from praying? Now, the devil, the, 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 the devil can do several things. He can try to convince you not to pray. Or the devil can try to convince us, if he's not going to convince us not to pray, then to pray less. Okay? Or to pray poorly. Because the devil can't win totally, at least he's going to try to win some minor victory. That's why we say an Ignatian holy hour is how long? It's 62 minutes, okay? So the Ignatian Holy Hour is we want to be faithful to that hour and we want to even go beyond it because sometimes the most abundant graces that God is going to give us is going to be in the last minute or the last two minutes. Amen? Okay. A couple of other Major obstacles. Another major obstacle in our prayer life is the reality of sin. Okay? If we're giving in to sin, and I'll make a, a general comment. What, why is it that so many in the younger generation have given up going to Mass, giving up communion, giving up going to confession. One of the principal reasons why is because they are committing sin and they have an addiction that they don't want to give up. And I'd be just very blunt, very often the addiction for the younger generation, not always the younger generation, is the addiction to pornography. That would be the number one addiction 
I would say in this country. And if some of you have older children, maybe adult children, that have decided not to go to church anymore, what I would do is maybe talk with them individually, go out and maybe have a cup of coffee with them in a very quiet environment and say, okay, you haven't gone to church for the past three or four years, whereas you used to always go to church. And say, in a very gentle way, it's probably because you have a problem, you have a problem with addiction to pornography. I say, it's going to be one-on-one, okay? One-on-one. And then say, look, you know, you probably have that addiction, but God loves you. God loves you, and you can overcome it with the help of God's grace. Because you've got young adults, they're not going to be able to overcome that temptation without God's grace. It's literally impossible. If I were a biological father, I'm not, and I noticed my children were not going to Mass, I would sit down and talk with them individually, and I'd bring this up. And they, they would probably have a, have a heart attack talking about this very delicate topic, but someone has to confront them. And someone has to confront them. Because we really, we, we really cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. We can't serve God and sin at the same time. So this would be this would be a general comment for our younger generation addicted to the mass media, addicted to these websites, and it's very difficult to give that up. Okay? So I would I would I would confront them. And tell them, I, as a mother, as a father, I love you very much. And I'm speaking to you now because I, I'm worried about the salvation of your soul. I don't want you to lose your soul for all eternity. And they say, look, you know, Christ, he's merciful. His arms are open. He'll forgive you. The just man falls seven times a day. Go back to the Lord. Try to make a good confession at the beginning of the new year. Go back and receive the Eucharist. Start to pray. And maybe you've been you've been addicted for this for 10, 15 years, okay? What? Okay, you, you go to confession and you you fall, then you're going to be falling less and less and less and less. As a a theologian and confessor, this is called the principle of graduality. So when I say principle of graduality, it means gradually falling less and less and less and less and less. And you arrive at a certain point with these addictions that where we were slaves to our addictions, we're starting to experience the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. Yeah. True freedom. And the devil wants to convince us that we're never going to be able to overcome our bad habits. That's the work of the devil. Yeah. That's the work of the devil. You're you're never you're never going to be over you, you'll never be able to overcome this powerful addiction. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, a course, uh, a course on prayer, would be incomplete if we did not invite Mary to be with us.
So we haven't talked about Mary. Just a word or two on the Blessed Mother. In your prayer life, beg the Blessed Virgin Mary, beg her, beg her for the grace to want to pray more and better. Beg Mary for that grace. If you beg Mary for that grace, that's an infallible petition. Mary will grant you that grace. It's infallible. Mary wants you to pray more than you want to pray. So at the beginning of this new year, consecrate yourself to Mary and get in the habit, get in the habit of praying the rosary. Yesterday I talked about, among many things, I gave you the different levels of prayer. And uh, Carlos came up and he mentioned that I, di I did skip one, and it would be, I told you I was going to give you nine, I gave you eight. Number, number five is infused recollection. I skipped that, so if you just want to write that in there. Infused recollection would be, you're already heading toward the mystical stages, the higher mystical stages. But, okay, related to the prayer that I'd like to end with, uh, see if you can fall in love with praying the rosary by yourself and be praying the rosary with, with your family. Now, the, ro the rosary... Okay, we're, talk, we're relating this to St. Teresa of Avila. The rosary is vocal prayer. Our Father, Hail Mary, glory be. The rosary is mental prayer. Okay, you're, you're meditating upon the words and the scenes. The rosary is contemplative prayer. So you're contemplating the scenes the life of Christ. The rosary is affective prayer because it's a prayer also of your heart. So all these different stages of St. Teresa of Avila, the nine different stages, a lot of these stages can be found simply in praying the rosary. So I'd like to, I'd like to summarize... Uh, one, uh, summarize one of the best books ever written on the rosary is called The Secret of the Rosary by St. Louis de Montfort. Okay? The Secret of the Rosary by St. Louis de Montfort is probably the best book ever written on the rosary in the Catholic Church. So here's a, in a very succinct summary of the book. Okay, a sinner... A sinner gets the rosary in his hands and he starts to pray the rosary fervently. The sinner is converted. Then de Montfort presents a convent of nuns. Deadbeat nuns. Okay? Okay? They're deadbeat nuns. But there's one nun, there's one nun in the convent that is on fire, and she's the one that loves the Blessed Mother and the Rosary. And she ends by converting the whole convent of nuns. Because of her, her, her love for Mary, it's, it's contagious. Then you have a priest and his parish. The parish is basically dead. What does he do? In his masses, in his groups, he preaches the rosary. He <coughs> prays the rosary with the people. And he invites the people, the families, to pray the rosary. And the parish is converted. 
Then you have a bishop. A bishop that has a diocese that's dead. They got some dioceses that are dead. So what does a bishop do? He tells the priest in his diocese to get to pray the rosary and to get the people to pray the rosary and the diocese is converted. And then John Paul II, who's the head of the church, what did he do in the year 2002? He wrote the apostolic letter, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary. What did he do? Hello? He told the whole world now, he told the whole world now to pray the rosary. Here you have the head of the church, possibly the greatest pope that ever lived, was John Paul II. He said, pray the rosary. And he said, pray the rosary. Look at what's going on now in the world for two reasons. Quoting Father Patrick Payton. Maybe you've heard of him. You've heard of Father Patrick Payton. He said, you have to pray the rosary for world peace. And you have to pray the rosary also for the family. Quoting Father Patrick Payton, the family that prays together, stays together, and a world at prayer is a world at peace. So in our conversation on this topic of of, of prayer, I think I would be remiss if I did not mention try to do all you possibly can to love Mary and to promote the rosary in your family, among your children, among your teenagers. You'll never, you'll never regret in your life praying the rosary and promoting the rosary. Amen? So, for your meditations, I forgot to give you a biblical passage last night because they're so, I was so engaged in the uh, literary source, but today I'd like to give you uh, these following passages because we have another day. After we finish, you have another day of retreat, right? Hello? So take Genesis chapter 32, verse 23, which is, Jacob battling with the angel. That was the very beginning of my talk. I said our spiritual life is spiritual combat. So that'll be one. I'm going to give you three verses. Okay, so that's Genesis chapter 23, 32 rather, verse 23. And I've given you a whole series of of obstacles that we have to encounter to be able to overcome our, our, our enemies, among which is the devil. Genesis 32, 23. Okay, the next would be Matthew chapter Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door is open to you. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door is open. If you like an acronym, A-S-K, right? Ask, seek, knock. Okay, you got it? Ask and you receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Okay? Ask, seek, knock. Now you got it? There's a little acronym there for you. Ask, seek, and knock. Do you know what ASAP means? Do you know? What? No, always say a prayer. Uh. (laughs) You got that? So that's a paganistic one I gave the supernatural one, okay? (laughs) Always say a prayer, right, Annie? Okay, then the next, the next verse is Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. The Catechism of the Catholic Church takes Luke chapter 18 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church on prayer, giving us two parables on prayer. 
And the first parable is the parable of the insistent widow. Remember that? The widow that goes knocking at the door day and night until the unjust judge gives in. So I've, I've mentioned more than once we have to have a determined determination not to give up prayer. Take that from that widow. Don't give up. Persevere. Persevere to the end. And then the parable that follows that is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Do you remember that parable? So that's Luke chapter 18. So the first message is we have to persevere until the end. And don't give up prayer. And the parable of the Pharisee and the publican is we have to be, like the gospel today, we have to be very humble. Okay? Like, the, like the leper today in the gospel, he comes to Jesus, he kneels down, he begs Jesus to help him out, says, Lord, if you can, you can heal me. Okay? One of the biggest, another biggest obstacles in prayer is our pride. Okay? Is our unwieldy pride. We have to be humble. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto yours. Amen? So, was this retreat helpful to you? Was it helpful? So, let's say Hail Mary. And then, Elvira has already made... The next retreat will be in two weeks. And you see on the front, it will be during the the feast day of St. Francis de Sales and the conversion of St. Paul. So it'll be related to that. If you notice that that phrase, it says, the measure of loving God is to love him without measure. And that's St. Francis Sales. Okay? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.